today on our calendar here in the United States it is June 23rd 2018 and on the Hebrew calendar Esel Betamuz Hamashim Vesheva Shevi'im Veshmone or the 10th day of Tammuz 5778 and I am going to begin a series. Now, I'm not going to call it Difficult Words, Part 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but I'm going to begin doing a series of messages on the difficult words of Yeshua. Um, there are some things that we read in the English that leave us scratching our heads and there is explanation for the things that he said and so I want to start us dealing with these various things so that we have an understanding of of what he said and why he said what he said um, Now, as we, today is going to be, so we're not going to actually deal with any text today. This is kind of the introduction. We need to establish some things before we actually get into the series. But we need to, there are some things that we need to know uh, prior to doing this. And some of these things... Um, fly in the face of conventional, long-held Christian beliefs. Okay, and what I'm what I'm sharing with you, beginning today, all of this has source material behind it, and you know research and so on. If you're really interested. Uh, in doing the more in-depth research on this particular topic, there is a book uh, that was written by, um, well, and I can't remember their first, their first names, but the last names are Biven, B-I-V-I-N, and Blizzard, and that's spelled just like what happens in the wintertime. called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. Okay? And at the end, I've got a slide that I'll bring up and leave up for a while so that you guys can write down the URL to a website that will take you to a PDF file. It's a paper uh, that's sort of a synopsis of this particular book. Uh, the paper is written by Weston W. Fields. And um, like I said, I'll put that up at the end and you can write down the URL and visit it if you're interested. But here are the things that we need to understand and know prior to going into what we're about to study. First of all, Hebrew was the primary language spoken and written by the Jews in Israel in Yeshua's day. Now the reason why this is a big deal is because conventional Christian belief for many, many years was that Aramaic was the language that was spoken by the Jews during this period of time. And the reason for that is because the people of Israel learned Aramaic when they were in captivity in Babylon. And so when they came back to Israel from Babylon, their primary language was Aramaic. But that was actually many centuries prior to the time of Yeshua. And by the time Yeshua came, 
uh, Hebrew was the common language, not Aramaic. And we'll, we'll actually, a little bit later, you'll find out how Aramaic was used. So most of Yeshua's teachings were done in Hebrew. All of this is very important for you to know because it all fits together and gives us an understanding of why things are the way they are today. The progression of what ended up happening from his time until today. Okay? So we need to get right, a right beginning if we're going to learn what we need to learn. The original accounts of Yeshua's life were written in Hebrew. Now, again, this goes against the long-held conventional understanding within Christian circles. They believed that the books were written in Greek. The scholarship today says that they weren't originally written in Greek, and the way that they know this is they have actually gone to the trouble of back-translating into Hebrew, okay? And it has proven to them by doing that that they were originally written in Hebrew and then translated into Greek. The Greek manuscripts that we currently possess today are a third or fourth stage in the written transmission of the stories, okay? So we don't even have the original Greek manuscripts. The, the ones that we have today are like third or fourth generation already, okay? In some cases, the manuscripts were apparently translated from Hebrew to Aramaic, then to Greek. Now, there's only a few of them that, that did this, but some of them went through this process. So you've got an, another step in the process. Every time, and we've talked about this in the past on multiple occasions, every time you take something that is written in one language and you try to translate it into another language, things are lost. It's just what happens because languages and cultures, the culture out of which the language comes, may not have concepts that the origin language contains. And so the translated language, the translators just have to do the best job that they can to try to get the idea across to the reader because they don't have it. They don't have that in their language. Okay, so every step of translation, so if you go from Hebrew to Aramaic, to Greek, and then to English, you've gone through several translations now, and you've lost a lot in the process. Again, this one, the, the old scholars have a hard time with this one, okay? Because forever they have said that Mark was the first gospel that was written. They've discovered because of comparing Matthew, Mark, and Luke to one another, that Luke had to have been the first one written. And, and again, this paper that I'm talking about, it has all of the details of how, how they came to this conclusion. Okay. I wish Hank was here today. <laughs> he would he would appreciate it. This was not something that he would he would agree with me, I'm sure. The key to understanding what Yeshua said is not a better understanding of Greek, but back translating to Hebrew. He would agree with you. I know he would. <laughs> Back translating restores proper Hebrew syntax, idioms, 
and word plays. That's how they know that it was originally written in Hebrew, is because when they back translate these texts to Hebrew, it restores what, what you lose. Again, it's, it's one of those things when you go to Greek, you lose the idioms. You lose proper syntax. You, you lose the word plays that are in Hebrew, which is done a lot. Okay? And for Hebrew speakers and thinkers, as they're reading the text, and they run on to these word plays, they immediately understand what is being communicated with the word play. And when you translate it into another language and you lose that word play, then now the understanding is gone. Okay? So, if the original manuscripts were written in Hebrew, why were they translated into Greek? And we, we touched on this before. At the time of Yeshua and following, after, after Yeshua's time, Greek was the global language, such as English is today. Okay? It was the language of commerce, of, of trade. So as you traveled around the world, Greek was the common language that people spoke. Okay? Thus, to reach the widest audience worldwide, the Brit HaKadoshah was translated into Greek. Okay? So now we ask the question, how does the Aramaic factor into the picture? Because one of the things that you guys probably missed, because it didn't dawn on me until I read this, what three languages, the plaque that was over Yeshua's head, what three languages were, was that plaque written in? Anybody, can anybody tell me? Yes? Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. No? Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Okay? So, you ha by, by logical, deductive thinking, you have to ask the question, if what the Christian scholars have said all this time, that Aramaic was the common language of the people of the time, why was it not written in Aramaic? on the plaque, okay? Because it wasn't the common language. Although Aramaic was certainly well known and spoken by the people of Israel in the first century and following, Aramaic was the language of the upper class and scholars. Hebrew was the language of the common people. Thus, in order to reach the widest audience in Israel, it behooved Yeshua and his Talmudim to teach and write in Hebrew. Because Yeshua's message, and we've also talked about this, on more than one occasion he said, I specifically, I have come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Period. It wasn't until after he ascended and the Ruach HaKodesh came that now there was a mandate to go beyond Israel and to take it to the nations. But up until that point, it was all about Israel. And so, how do you reach the people of Israel? You speak their language. So we ask the question, why is knowing all of this important information important before we begin looking at Yeshua's difficult words? Why do we read Scripture? Is it not so that its words will have impact on our lives? 
It is Hashem's desire that His Word would impact the lives of all people everywhere through all time. We need to remember some things. We need to remember what Dr. Tucker said in the video that we just watched. He, said, he made this statement. Now, I didn't put it in quotes because I didn't know whether I was exactly quoting what he said. But he said something to the effect, it is impossible for the text to mean to us today what it never could have meant to the original author and or audience. Okay? If, if the body at large could get this one thing down, then we would eliminate a lot of the bad theology that exists today. Because what has happened is teachers and scholars have in essence created something from the text that should never have been created because it couldn't mean that. And so we've got all of these wacky doctrines floating around that are confusing people and leading people astray. And it's because they didn't implement this one rule. If according to the Greek or English texts we are being made to understand something in an incorrect manner, we are not receiving the truth of Hashem that will impact our lives in the manner which He desires. It's called theological error. And the body has been extremely guilty of theological error for a very, very long time. It started, and we're not talking about this being a recent thing. The theological error started in the first century. Okay? And it's gotten progressively worse as time has gone by. I had this conversation with someone last Shabbat. We were talking about in mathematics, we understand and learn that the shortest distance from point A to point B is a straight line. And we're taught in geometry classes, they teach us, you know, the, the teacher will have us purposely, between point, and a, point A and point B, deviate at the beginning, at point A, by a degree and then draw the line from that point. And what ends up happening? So you may be very, very close down here at point A, but by the time you get out here to point B, you're way away from, from where B is supposed to be. Okay? Well, both in Christian circles and in the Jewish circles, that's what happened. Okay, so you've got the center, and you've got Judaism deviating, if you want to call it a degree, in one direction, and Christianity deviating a degree in the other direction. And by the time we get out here to today, now not only are both sides very far from the center, from the place where God intended us to be, but we're extremely far away from one another. And yet the origin is the same. And so we have to be careful about theological error because it is what causes us to deviate by a degree. And then we end up way off in left field somewhere believing something that we shouldn't believe and building our life. See, that's the issue. We build our life around these things. Over time, it becomes part of our identity. We have practiced it so long, it is who we are. And so when someone comes along and challenges that, and we find out, hey, 
what they're telling me is the truth. What am I supposed to do with this? Because if I change this, it's going to change everything. So, obviously, the best thing is that let's not deviate at point A. Okay? Now, I understand every single one of us, we're all trying the best that we can with what we've got. Those that are really, truly pursuing God, we're, we're pursuing with all of our heart in genuine affection for Him, in a genuine desire to pursue Him, to obey Him, so on and so forth. But there is not a single person in this world that has it right. I will tell you that right now. Okay? We will not have it right until Yeshua comes. And He will tell us, this is what's right. This is how you do it. Exactly like this. And then everyone will know what to do and how to do it. Until then, we're struggling to know what to do. But we must try our best and do everything that we can to avoid theological error. And I could, go, I could go into examples. I've used examples before about how passages are translated into English. And when you go back and look at the original text, it does not say what they translated into English at all. And you end up scratching your head and going, how in the world did they get from this in the original text, to that in English. And yet, denominations are building whole empires based on theological error. This is a quote from this paper written by Weston W. Fields. One of the most striking indications of Jesus' use of Hebrew comes from His words on the cross. And I cannot tell you, I've lost count of how many teachers that I have heard say that when Yeshua was on the cross and He cried out to God, He cried out in Aramaic. How many people have heard that taught? Okay? Okay? So in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. Heli, heli, lama sabakskani. Although Mark 15, 34 records them in Aramaic, Elwi, Elwi, Lama Sabakskani, quoting the Targum to Psalm 22, the context seems to indicate that Jesus must have uttered them in Hebrew because Eli was a shortened form of Eliyahu or Elijah, only in Hebrew. And the bystanders thought that Jesus was calling for Elijah. Only Hebrew can account for the misunderstanding. Now, Biven and Blizzard, he goes on to say, could have pointed out the obvious psychological fact that the utterance of a man in pain and in the throes of death without any doubt whatsoever would have been in the language he most was most accustomed to using. Okay? When you're dying, you're not going to start speaking in another language. Your brain is in such survival mode, automatically you're going to go to what you normally speak. 
If he had uttered in Aramaic, the people around him would not have been saying, why is he crying out for Elijah? So all of these years, we have been, it's been beat into us. Yeshua spoke Aramaic. Yeshua spoke Aramaic. He taught in Aramaic. Wrong. So now, what, what is happening in the scholarly world is they're having to go back and fix everything now. This is a quotation from a book called Unseen Realm by Dr. Michael S. Heiser. He says the proper context for interpreting the Bible is the context of the biblical writers. You hear that and you go, well, duh, right? The context that produced the Bible. Every other context is alien to the biblical writers and therefore to the Bible. Yet there is a pervasive tendency in the believing church to filter the Bible through creeds, confessions, and denominational preferences. So we say, we listen to the statement, this profound statement, and go, duh, but what is actually being done? Are they interpreting the Bible in the context of the biblical writers? In the context that actually produced the Bible? No, they're not. Again, another issue in regards to theological error is the denominations have established their own set of belief structure and now when we look at the Scripture and we interpret Scripture, we are going to force the Scripture into our belief structure. It doesn't matter that it really doesn't make sense. We're going to make it make sense. And if you ask us questions about why it doesn't make sense, we're going to go, well, that's just the way it is. It, you just have to believe that in faith, brother. <laughs> so we have to be very careful in studying the Scripture. Let me give you some other Well, let's look at what this slide says. This is why it is so important to know the context and meaning of the original words written or spoken. We do not want to be basing our beliefs and, and or actions on theological error, which is unfortunately quite prevalent in the body today. There's that, that URL. I want us to I'm just going to give as examples a couple different texts. Luke chapter 23, verse 31. This is a statement that Yeshua makes. I believe this is being quoted from the King James Version of the Bible. Luke 23, 31, and I, I believe, Mark, you have a King James, right? Okay. I'm going to quote this and you tell me whether this is from King James or not. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I believe that this is from King James. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? What? Is that what it says in King James? Okay. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Okay. Well, the whole the problem is it's a bad translation. 
Okay? That's the reason why it doesn't make any sense. So this passage is explained against the background of Ezekiel's prophecy against Jerusalem and its temple in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 45, through chapter 21, verse 7. Jesus identifies himself with the green tree, a messianic symbol of the times, and the dry tree with the people of Jerusalem who would face a worse fate than Jesus at the hands of the Romans. Biven suggests that in should be against. So if we replaced in with against, for if they do these things against a green tree, what shall be done against the dry? Yeah, doesn't it? One word. Okay. So this brings the whole context back to an original Hebrew thought. Okay. Here's another text. Luke chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll read it again. It won't, it's not going to make any more sense the second time. <laughs> Luke 12, 49 and 50. But this is in the King James Version, so... Yeah. Okay. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Pain. Huh? P A I N E D. Pain. Pained? Straightened or pained. Okay. All right. Let me explain. This enigmatic statement is the occasion for the most lengthy and fascinating explanation that Biven offers. By comparing the verse with Matthew 3:11, and Isaiah 66, 15, and 16, and by explaining the many Hebraisms latent in the verse, Biven shows that it is better translated, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. How, but how could I wish it, meaning the earth, were already burned up? I have a baptism to baptize, and how distressed I am till it is over. Okay. So in essence, what Yeshua is saying is, I am bringing judgment, punishment on the earth. Okay. It pains me to have to do it. Okay. I don't want you all to be destroyed, but I have to do this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah 66, 15, and 16. But see how when we properly translate a statement that Yeshua makes, it now makes sense to us. Whereas when it's not translated correctly, it just, it just sounds like a bunch of nonsense, actually. And, and so... We're going to begin taking these passages um, in the Gospels that are like this, where we, as we are reading through the Gospels, we're, we end up scratching our heads and just like you did and going, what in the world does this mean? How am I su supposed to derive any benefit to my life 
from statements like this when I cannot understand what is being said. Okay? God, Hashem, never intended for it to be this way. Okay? It's not His desire for us to be confused about what His Word says. And now, we d I make the statement it wasn't His desire for it to be this way. At the same time, we do have to say He allowed it. He allowed it for a time, but the time has come that we restore what has been said so that we indeed can benefit from what has been written. Yeshua, the whole point of Yeshua's life, now His death, we know what His death was all about. That was about the redemption of mankind and the end to the reign of the kingdom of Hasatan. Okay? But His life, up until that point in time, the whole thrust was to teach was to teach us what we need to know in order to live for His Father the way that we should live. So if we're get, being given statements in English that are so obscure that we cannot figure out what it means, we, we are not deriving any benefit. And Yeshua wants us to know. And so we're going to start unpacking these passages like this and dealing with them one by one. Did everybody get a chance to write the URL down that wanted to? It's a pretty lengthy URL. Yeah, that, yeah um, suggestion like Paul is doing. You can take a picture of it with your phone. Okay. It will also be on YouTube whenever you publish this. Yes. That's yeah, point. that's true. Okay. Well, let's pray. Well, Abba, we thank you your word is life. Your word is the truth. Truth changes people. It sets us free. Father, we want to be set free in every way. If there's anything that we are missing that we could glean from what you have said, we want to know. We want to know every word. We want to be intimate with everything that you thought, everything that you said, everything you taught. So, Father, reveal the truth to us as we proceed through this series of messages, Lord God. May our eyes and our understanding be opened by the Ruach HaKodesh. In Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.